Oh, hello there. Hey there. I didn't notice you over there. Hi, I'm Taika Waititi. I'm Stephen Merchant. And we're here to break down a scene for my new film, Jojo Rabbit. This, this is... Notes on a Scene. This is Notes on a Scene. Notes on a Scene. Notes The genesis of this project started back in 2010 when I read a book called Caging Skies by Christine Lernens and told this, the poignant story of a young boy growing up in Nazi Germany during that Second World War. And he discovers that his mother is hiding a young girl in his attic. I felt it's very necessary to keep reminding ourselves that uh, the events of World War II and also basically all wars um, are something that need to be avoided at all costs and we stop telling these stories. There's a danger that we'll forget the events of World War II and there's another deeper danger that we, you know, some of those things may repeat themselves. My initial reaction reading the script was, oh, here we go, yet another boy in his imaginary Hitler script. How many of these have I read? But, you know, this one seemed to have a, a, a surprisingly fresh take on that well-worn story. And um, at some point every tall Englishman is asked to play a uh, Nazi in a film. And I was holding out for the big bucks. Mm -hmm. Didn't get them with this project. Right. <laughs> I got them. Not even sure I got paid. So we're about to watch a scene in which uh, my character, who's a Gestapo agent, what? Captain I'm Deers, that. Um, enters the home of Jojo Rabbit in his, in his spooky, sneaky, scary Gestapo way. Mm -hmm. Hitler. There's oh, the money shot. There he is, there's the big man right there. Steve. Money, money man. <laughs> you know, I wanted to bring something in to sort of disrupt the um, the relationship between Jojo and Elsa. I thought what better way than to have their home raided by the Gestapo. There's Jojo. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Captain Hermann Dietz of the Falkenheim Gestapo. With me, Herr Muller, Herr Juncker, Herr Klum and Herr Frosch. May we come in? Thank you so much. Heil Hitler. 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 It's always a challenge making a film that has a mixture of comedy and drama. But I, I test my films all the time with the audiences, so, and then I go and adjust, adjust the film, and I, you know, maybe bring the jokes down over here and bring some, you know, a bit of pathos up. And, and it's about just sort of testing it again and again until you feel like there's a tonal balance that you know where it's not making light of these serious, serious um, subject matter. And it's not just like a full-on drama. And you do want that, you know, you want that in a film. You want tension, you want conflict, and you want an audience to worry for the characters and to feel like the stakes are pretty high. I always wondered, do they have to highlight Hitler every time they went into a room? It seems like they had to do it all the time. Right. And I just felt like it would have just taken ages for them to do anything. Always, a especially if it was a group of like 30 of them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and they turn up and they're like, Quick, we've got to go do that thing! Yeah, hang, hang on. And then, and I feel like it's, it's something that Monty Python would, probably would have done if they did a sketch full of Gestapo officers. And then they get to work. They go in there and they start tearing the place apart and looking for information. So this film was shot by Mihai Malimer. He's a fantastic Romanian cinematographer and um, so he's responsible for just how great the film looks and coupled with this wonderful production design well, I wanted to show that they had a bit of money but often in these films it's you know the, the circumstances are very grim and just from doing research Germany at the time it was a very very colorful place the Germans were very into the latest trends and fashions and textiles and designs the facade you know in Germany is like all this colorful um, a celebration of what they think is you know the them moving into the future and you know this bright future when really behind that facade everything is crumbling and falling apart. Hey, Jojo! Hey guys! Good to see you. And here comes Sam Rockwell. My bicycle got a flat tire. So I carried it. Captain Klinsendorf. Heil Hitler. 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 We're not doing anything, we're just watching this <laughs> yeah, movie. I'm, I'm not fascinated yeah. by this. Yeah. <laughs> this is really good. So here um, you'll notice that they say Heil Hitler. I think it's a record maybe. Oh. 31 times in one minute. Congratulations. Is that the right thing to say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Everyone else You're is congratulations. And the point of having all those Heil Hitlers, apart from I think being quite a funny moment, is also to 
just to again point out just how ridiculous Nazis were because yes. they were so so obsessed with you know these rules that they had created for themselves, which I think were rules that, that uh, I think quite soon after they created them, though, I bet they were like, oh no, yeah, why, did we, why did we invent this stupid thing? That's what I like to think about Hitler. Soon after he adopted that moustache, he decided he didn't want it. But then yeah. he was known for it and he right. couldn't get rid of it. That's of course it, yeah. So, Do you think he experimented with other ones um, prior to that? Yes. He perhaps had the kind of large classic handlebar, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe the sort of... He would have had like that, sort of... Like that. Yep. And then like that. He would have had that. And then he would have... And then also, I, he, this one time I heard, he got he grew his moustache so long mm. that it went round the back of his head, wow. and then up on the top, and this was all this was all moustache. That was all moustache. It was all moustache, and then tied it into a little into a little bow like that. Yeah, and he was very proud of that. And then yeah. also the moustache, he split it off like that. He split into eyebrows. Into eyebrows. Yeah, and then connected them there. But I understand it was because it was a quite an operation every morning when he woke up. <laughs> oh, yeah, just to, to, to tie that a into a bow, and he didn't. So that's why, in the end, it's braided. So it. oh, you know I'm just going to have a really tiny little one beneath, beneath my nostrils that looks like two furry black slugs have crawled out of my <laughs> nose. You know, Freddie thinking. Hi Hitler. Hi Hitler. Hi Hitler. So usually I do a not storyboard. Actually, you know what? I think I probably storyboarded this one because there were so many people. But then I got bored of drawing so many people in a tiny, you know, tiny little rectangle. Is that why later in the movie there's just much fewer people? Yeah. <laughs> it's right. Because I don't like drawing people yeah, storyboards. Like so, yeah. yeah, you decided there would only be two people in every scene. Mm -hmm. Smart. So did I miss anything? No, no, we were just Heil Hitlering the boy and then Heil Hitlering yourself and then, of course, Heil Hitlering Freddie Finkel and now we're in the midst of a routine inspection. So we're talking about Sam's eye here. He's got a dead eye or... A, I don't think it's a glass eye, it's a dead eye. Oh, shoot, I am sort of sprayed this everywhere, sorry. But that's quite nice, though, isn't it? Two little pink dots on Alfie. I'm going to make him a bit more of a polka dot guy. I think it's actually quite in keeping with his character. This is a wonderful insight into the filmmaking process. Back to Sam's eye, we had to find a reason for him not to be forced to the front, uh, to the front lines to be fighting, you know, and I thought, well, maybe he's missing a leg. That would be a good, good, good reason to not have to go and fight. Totally. Or an arm. I still don't trust that trick when you stick your arm behind your back. Yeah. I don't know if that looks real. And so I just thought, well, he's got, let's just have him missing an eye. And that's the story behind that eye. Now let's see what happens to these dots when I press play again. Oh, now it's just... On the wall. And you've highlighted my nose. <laughs> okay. And uh, what brings you here, Captain? Oh, we were just passing by and we thought we'd drop off some pamphlets for the boy. He, he works for us. Well, there's a good example of uh, me using my height um, for comic effect. Classic dominant stare down, which you're very well known for. Looking down with those piercing... Oh, you just did it to well, me then. It was important to me in this yeah, scene that, again. despite the fact we were... Please, pay attention. This is important for young filmmakers. It was important to me that this character's both kind of buffoonish but also quite intimidating. I think it was more just about the sort of style of delivery being conversational, because mm -hmm. I think... Well, there's a danger, isn't there? Because I was worried that it's going to... Oh, it's like a typical Gestapo scene. But what's really disarming and what's, what makes your character even creepier is the fact that he is so sort of casual. Well, in my mind, these men who were in the Gestapo were often quite petty bureaucrats who probably were not um, terribly well-respected people. They'd have been perhaps bank managers or accountants. Nothing wrong with bank managers and accountants. I'm not suggesting they're all they're Nazis. They're not Nazis. No, but I'm just saying these were probably just regular people that suddenly got given this station and they mm -hmm. had the power of life and death over people. They weren't actually doing any of the atrocity themselves. They were just sort of allowing it to occur. And that makes them all the more despicable and all the more abhorrent because they're sort of weak, pathetic people, you know, but they've got this little badge that gives them enormous Sorry, power. Exactly. I th if you recall in this scene, I was already, uh, as I'm freakishly tall, I'm taller than everybody who's ever worked with me, um, and then you stuck me on a box to make me even taller. I did do so I'm that. actually stood on a, on, a, on a box there. This is Sam's ear. That's where you spend all the money when you work with Sam Rockwell. <laughs> on the ears. On the left ear. <laughs> and that's what you'll see in many of the shots in the film, it's just from this angle on him. Ten bucks. A hundred and six. 106 bucks. Yeah. 106 dollars for that year. <laughs> oh, you know how it is. Every day we take a call. Hello, is that the Gestapo? I believe there's a communist hiding behind my fridge. We go around to investigate. It's just some mold. So not far off. It's all part of the job. I think it fits into a long tradition of movies that have used humour to satirise Hitler. 
that date back until the, into, into the 40s itself when Hitler was still in power, whether it be Chaplin's The Great Dictator, To Be or Not To Be, Ernest Lubitsch film, obviously famously uh, Mel Brooks in the, in the 60s. It seems strange to me that you know, 80 years later, we're feeling ever so worried and that, that suddenly this subject can't be mocked. And, and again, the subject, you know, the nonsense of Hitler's ideology and the kind mm -hmm. of absurdity of those beliefs, which when, as soon as you poke holes in them, or begin to question them, they kind of fall apart in your hands. And that's, I think, what you dramatize with the little boy. You know, as soon as he starts to question his beliefs, because there's finally someone that makes him do it, he realizes that they're sort of built on sand. And the idea that you can sort of mock that as a theme or tear that apart seems weird to me. Well, that's and right. it actually offends me. Yeah. Yeah, no, me too. I'm, I'm, offended. I, no, I'm, offend you. I'm offended you. No, I'm, no, I'm offended by people that think no, we can't funny. make films about this subject. What irks me, Yeah. I, love, say I love the word irk, yeah. What irks me is people who say that comedy is not, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not an effective tool or it's not, you know, something to be taken seriously as an art form. And it's one of the most powerful tools that we have to fight against, you know, against oppression and bigotry and uh, intolerance. And again, as you say, to poke holes and to make fun of, you know, these these belief systems and these people who promote hate. Yeah, people like us who work in comedy, it's as though we're constantly being accused that we're not serious. Yeah, oh, you well, can't deal with this subject because you won't treat it seriously. But we're some of the most serious people. Right. I know, I'm certainly very serious. I am. As you can tell from the tone of my voice right now. And the way that you're staring at me yeah. like that. Isn't I'm that quite serious. intimidating? Look at me. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. serious. We're very think. serious people. This is my serious. This is how I get serious. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm serious now. I'm serious. 